everyone, thank you so much for showing up and for joining us here via Zoom. My name is Galit Friedlander. I am your host. I am first and foremost and always a dancer. I'm a dance teacher and educator, choreographer. I host the Dance Speak podcast, shameless plug, Dance Speak on iTunes, Google Play Music, and Spotify. And we recently had an episode with one of the panelists, Dr. Linda Bluestein, and I am a certified personal trainer. So this is my jam.com. I'm like in heaven right now. <laughs> and we, this would not be happening without Doctors for Dancers. So Doctors for Dancers, they have this phenomenal database with all of these different specialists for health and wellness that understand dancers' needs. Most of them have dance background themselves. It's exactly what I've been looking for my whole life. So also, if you wanna connect with any of the specialists here, if you wanna know more about them, be sure to check out their website. We also have YouTube videos from our past Zoom panels. Check those out um, and lots of resources for you. So we also have COVID-19 panels. So that's super important, all about masks, the importance of warming up. And we're going to have a couple of polls at the beginning. So first I'm going to intro our amazing guests and then we're going to have the two polls. So starting off, I feel like this is like a parade, like starting off and you like break through and you're like <laughs> dancing here. We got Dr. Linda Bluestein, who's been practicing medicine for over 20 years and has helped countless people restore function and improve their quality of life. As a former ballet dancer and instructor, she has a special interest in treating dancers and other artistic athletes who are at increased risk of hypermobility disorders. We have Dinah Hampson, who is the owner of Pivot Dancer in Canada. She does dip manual and manipulative physiotherapy, dip sports physiotherapy. She is a certified IMS practitioner, certified pelvic floor physiotherapist. And her passion comes from classical ballet in which she studied intensively until she made a career decision to apply science and academics to movement and become a physical therapist. Shout out to all the physical therapists out there watching, listening, doing the hard work. We have Jennifer Milner, Milner, who is a certified Pilates trainer specializing in dancers and post-injury recoveries. As a classical ballet dancer, Jennifer danced with several companies across the country, then moved to New York for musical theater. Who are my musical theater people out there? I'm hyped. I'm hyped. This is like a concert right now. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Aiden Leslie. She's a former pre-professional dancer and current college student. She started dance classes as a toddler before beginning serious ballet training at the age of 10. She's trained with several schools such as American Ballet Theater, National Ballet of Canada, and Pacific Northwest Ballet before retiring at 18 due to health issues. She was diagnosed with hypermobility type Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, which we'll be mentioning a lot in this time. So Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS at age 16, as well as postural orthostatic. Oh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. <laughs> Can we get tach tachycardia. tachycardia. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful in unison syndrome, POTS, and chronic migraines. And I know growing up, I went to performing arts high school, so many dancers injured out, and we tend to not ever hear back or be able to necessarily look necessarily learn from it. So seriously, thank you so much for being open about your journey, Aiden, which we'll sure. get into. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So why don't we start off with the poll, which you're going to be receiving in a moment as I learn how to not jumble all my words into one word. Can't make any promises. <laughs> This is so cool. It's like we're all in the room together with hands going up in the air and stuff. I love this. Uh, that's awesome. Great. We'll give it about 10 more seconds. And then we're going to close out poll number one. Five, four, three, two, one. Maybe like the awesome. Jeopardy theme song to play. <laughs> oh yeah we need some music for this 
And are we doing one more poll, doctors? Okay. Okay, I thought we had a second poll. Ah, there we go, bam. <laughs> I, know, I, really <laughs> I know I don't have mo hypermobility because my straddle is like this. Oh, that doesn't, like that. Mean, doesn't mean anything. Mean anything. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> I have my, like 45 degree mic mobility <laughs> maximum. Well, I, I've been in class before and the teacher stopped the class because my arm wouldn't perfectly straighten. And she just stopped and like, and she forgot she did this. And like a year later did the same thing. She's like, did you get in an accident? Is your arm broken? And I'm like, no, this is what my joints look like. <laughs> TMI. All right, we're gonna give it about 10 more seconds. Nine, dun, 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 dun. five seconds, four, three, two, one. Woo, thank you everyone for participating. So I would like to start with Dr. Bluestein. We wanted to begin with what are three indicators that you have a disorder and why, like why learn about this period? So I did have a few slides that maybe I'll just like share real quick here, assuming that I can figure out how to do that. Just to and make if you need, <laughs> if you need a moment, I can switch it are over. Are we good? Nope. Come on. No, we can't see it. Yeah, I can see it. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. Okay, cool. So, so I wanted to just kind of, um, I, I'm a very visual person. I thought it might be helpful just to show a few things, just to help um, people understand the difference between hypermobility and hypermobility disorders and what are um, just a few things that, so we're all kind of on the same page before we even really start. So, um, oh, that's not the button to advance the slide. There we go. Okay. So what is joint hypermobility? So uh, basically joint hypermobility just simply means that a joint has greater than anticipated range of motion. And it uh, could be one joint, could be lots of joints, um, but mobility is range of motion of a joint and hyper means greater than it would be expected for that joint. And a hypermobility disorder, and you may recognize this beautiful young lady here, um, a hypermobility disorder is when a person is, um, you know, not just having some bendy joints as we um, often refer to, but they actually have some symptoms that may be related to the fact that they are hypermobile. And they may or may not have an underlying connective tissue disorder. So Galit mentioned Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, it's an S if you're referring to like more than one type, which there is more than one type, but Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are a group of connective tissue disorders and hypermobility disorders is kind of like that bigger umbrella. And so some people have joint hypermobility, that increased range of motion, and some people have joint instability, which is where the joint doesn't stay in proper alignment all of the time. Um, some have one, some have both. Those two things are not synonymous. So there's a lot of talk in the literature, especially over the last 50 years, as to is joint hypermobility an asset or a liability? And in dance, joint hypermobility is an asset, but hypermobility disorders are generally a liability. We don't want symptoms. We don't want to be having pain or dizziness or headaches. And we'll get into what some of those other things are in just a minute. Um, and these are the most vulnerable physiques. So as uh, our very first Bendy Bodies uh, podcast, I'm going to put in a shameless plug for, for uh, Jennifer Milner's and my podcast. Our very first interview was with Moira McCormick, the physical therapist, uh, physiotherapist for the Royal Ballet. And she talked about how people with joint hypermobility, um, extremely common in ballet dancers especially, and they have the most vulnerable physiques. So it's extremely important to know how to work with a hypermobile body, even if that person doesn't have any symptoms. So you might've heard of the Bighton score, and I, I'm not gonna go into this really right now because in, in the interest of time, um, but it's just important to know that there are limitations of this scoring system. It only checks a limited number of joints, in a, in a dancer, it's not necessarily the joints that we care about. It omits the, the shoulder, for example, the ankle. Um, so if you've heard of that, it's an important thing to know about, but it's not the be all and end all. 
I prefer to use what's called the five point questionnaire. And um, these are the questions on the five point questionnaire. And if a person answers yes to two or more of these questions, then that has, um, according to a lot of different studies that have been done in all different languages and all over the world, that has an 85% sensitivity and specificity for generalized joint hypermobility. So you know how I said hypermobility and hypermobility disorders? This is for hypermobility, but a subset of hypermobility, which is generalized. So if a person has just fingers and toes, that's called peripheral joint hypermobility. If they have just a few joints like their shoulders, um, that's localized. But if you start having like five or more joints, then that's called generalized joint hypermobility. So this five point questionnaire, a lot of people get confused. They think that this is a questionnaire for EDS or a hypermobility disorder, and it's not. It's a questionnaire for generalized joint hypermobility. Um, and though we, we now believe that, that hypermobility disorders occurs you know, kind of along a spectrum, and that's kind of a good way to think about it. Some things that you might see that maybe would indicate that a dancer might have a hypermobility disorder, are they having a lot of pain? Are they having a lot of tendon issues? Um, are they having a lot of issues with um, joints becoming dislocated or subluxed? Are they having problems with joint instability? Are they having what's called hyperalgesia or allodynia? And that means that their body is more sensitive to pain than normal. So things that normally wouldn't hurt are painful in somebody that has a hypermobility disorder, or they can be. That's something that, that could um, make you think, makes me think as a physician who evaluates these people, makes me think this is a possibility. So here are some other um, things that a person might have, a dancer might have that might indicate that perhaps they have a hypermobility disorder. Now, a really important thing to notice with these conditions or these um, uh, symptoms that a person might present with, these are, these are some of the more common things. So part of the challenge is hypermobility disorders as an umbrella are fairly common. These things are also fairly common. So when you are looking, trying to study like the more common symptoms within a more common condition, it's really challenging. You need large numbers in order to compare populations and see, is it more common, more prevalent amongst this population as compared to this one? If it's more rare within the general population, then it's easier to study. So, um, oops. oh, and then scoliosis. I wanted to mention that because scoliosis is, is kind of an interesting one. Scoliosis is more prevalent in dancers and scoliosis is also more prevalent in people with hypermobility. And there's actually not as much literature on this as I would think that there would be at this point. Um, but actually, I am in the process of doing a research project on this um, right now. So hopefully we'll get some more information. So in terms of when we might suspect a, an actual connective tissue disorder, so meaning that the building blocks of connective tissue, which is present all throughout our body, and it's exactly what it sounds like, connects one thing to another, connects everything to everything else. It's in our tendons and our ligaments and um, in, our, in our bones, um, collagen. It's, it's all over, like in our gut, it's all over the place. Um, these are some of the signs or symptoms that you might see in a connective tissue disorder. And so these things are more specific to those kinds of things. And you're probably wondering, what is arachnodactyly? Um, that basically is just a way of saying long fingers and long toes. So when you do that, there's two different tests that you do for that. It's wrapping the hand around the wrist and then also putting the thumb and wrapping the fingers around it. So those are some of the things that we might see with a connective tissue disorder, or at least makes us think about it. Um, so basically, anytime a dancer has um, signs or symptoms in multiple different bodily systems, we need to think about this. And if you can't connect the issues, we say think connective tissues. Um, it's also really super important to know that, um, especially for EDS, uh, I had a patient tell me once, it's an owner-specific diagnosis, and I love that phrase because it's so true. Um, there's also a saying, if you've seen one EDS patient, you've seen one EDS patient. So um, it's really important to be aware that, you know, we're presenting general information. Hopefully this will be really helpful. Um, there's a lot of nuances. And so I think that was my last slide that I wanted to 
yeah, we'll get to maybe that later. So I will stop share so we can talk to everyone else. Thank you. And for Dinah, I wanted to know, could you hone in for us on the difference between flexibility versus joint hypermobility? Yes, I can. So I was thinking of how I could possibly illustrate this. And I'm really excited that you invited me from like way up north here. So I, I have these shirts that I love that keep my hands warm because I live in the north. And I was thinking, okay, if, if you had like a ball and socket, so you have, this is going to be my ball. It's not going to work perfect, but hang in there with me. And this is my socket. So if I tuck it in my little sleeve here, so a joint has two surfaces that join together and then it has soft tissue that holds it together. So when it's really nice and snug, then that's a joint that's going to have good congruency and it's going to move really well together. When a joint has flexibility, it means that it moves within its normal range in the whole spectrum of range. So if we expect this joint to be able to move 100 degrees, it's going to move that full 100 degrees. If somebody is inflexible, then they'd move less than that. When a joint then becomes hypermobile, it means that this soft tissue holding is just a little slack and a little loose, like an old shirt. So now this ball can really roll around in there. And then to Linda's point, you know, when that joint sort of becomes unstable, this tissue is like gone. So then the joint can really roll around. Does that make sense? I love that. Okay. Okay, good. I'll yeah, speak for, I was for just thinking myself. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> well, <laughs> me what too. I'm, what I'm thinking about is, you know, the, the topic here of the, the whole thing is what do dancers need to know about bendy bodies? And what I'm wondering now from the other end, if you're not a health practitioner, right? Or like when I have my choreography hat as the dancer who's in class, how does one know? And there, I don't know if there is a clear answer. How does one know or discern whether you're the professional teacher, choreographer, or dancer when you're overexerting your body or pushing it too far? Because I've worked with tons of dancers that are just like, look what I can do, and their leg just flings here. Or is there any way to start having a ballpark idea of what's too much? And I'm asking the panel. I know this is like nothing we, or, or, or um, any questions we can start to ask ourselves as that we're not medical professionals, like how do we discern as the dancer or as the person in charge of the room? Uh, well, I would say, and, and, and you guys can jump in on here. I would say, ask yourself a few questions. You know, I have little bitties. I'm in Texas, which is, there's a lot of competition studios here and there's always that pressure on them to be able to have more flexibility and show more tricks and do all that, which is catching up in the, in the ballet world as well. The ballet world is feeling that pressure to do more end range things. Um, and I would say, ask yourself, if you're a dancer, um, how am I getting to this position? And how comfortable is this position? Uh, do I feel like I'm working in this position or is gravity doing the work? Uh, an easy place to think about it is hyperextended knees. You know, when people stand and their legs are straight like this, but if they sit back in their knee sockets and they give that long hyperextended line that people think is really cool, they're not working to hold themselves up. They're hanging back on that joint. So if you apply that to those huge flexible backs, like the photos that were in Dr. Blustein's presentation, she's one of my dancers and she can, you know, go all the way over into that. Is that comfortable to stay in? No. <laughs> if I cue her to use her muscles and to try to work it from a position of strength rather than just passively hanging there, um, it may not look as crunched and perfectly folded up, but you can see that it's from a, a healthier place. So as an instructor, um, as a choreographer, I might say to them, how does that feel when you do it? How does it feel when you think about doing it 20 times? <laughs> you know, and try to try to find, start asking those questions and then try to build um, strength. If you're the dancer, try to build strength around that. Aiden, how, how did you know if it was healthy or not when you were doing things? Yeah, that was sort of what you were talking about. It was, it was always pretty easy to get into the positions. Like I could always just sort of whack a body part into wherever it needed to go but it would be really easy to get there. Uh, I'd know if it was out of, uh, sort of in the end range or in the danger zone, as I like to think of it, uh, if I wasn't working at all, if it was just almost too easy where I could just sort of hang out there for just a little bit. 
it was that moment when sort of the teachers or, or you would cue me in and I'd have to sort of start working the muscles and then it would sort of shrink back to where it should probably be. Uh, and then I could hold it and I felt much more stable. Uh, so basically my cue was if it's way too easy for a very short amount of time, that means it's a little bit out of range for me. <laughs> Well, and Aiden, can you just share with us a little bit about your story? And to everyone who's watching right now, we thought um, it's so, and, and this was brilliant um, to, to, for the specialist that brought you on here, because we could talk all day about this, but if it's not connecting to the dancers, like mm -hmm. that's, I think, where the work really happens. So can you tell us a bit about your journey and how you need to start seeing a specialist also and what that was like for you? Absolutely. I, uh, like I said, I started as a toddler and I feel like when you're really little, hypermobility is such a huge asset because no one really has any strength at that point. So you're just the kid that can whack their leg up and do all this crazy stuff. Like I was nicknamed Gumby when I was a kid in dance classes. That was sort of my, my shtick was that I could do all the crazy stuff. Um, but then when I got older, it's about 10, 11, 12, when we started going on point and the other kids started getting stronger. Uh, I was not. I was. I still had that flexibility, but I had. I wasn't getting any of the the muscle mass to be able to support it and to be able to grow with my dance technique and start doing more challenging things. Mm. Uh, and that's. I remember my nemesis was always like consecutive single leg releves. I could not do those. It was such a struggle. Um, and I, I started getting when I was about 15. I started getting more challenging roles, and I was going off to summer programs, and I wanted to be able to better thrive in those environments. So I started working with Jennifer Milner uh, as, as sort of my, my uh, helper to, to sort of strengthen. And um, she was the one that we had our like intro meeting and she said, tell me, have you heard of this thing called hypermobility of Taylor Stamlow syndrome? So she was the one that kind of cued me and had me start researching into it and asked my doctor about it. And from there, we started working regularly and it was very helpful to, to work with Pilates and, and sort of that that personalized strengthening um, because I was having lots of joint issues. I have, uh, I have hypermobility, so I was having subluxations of many joints. I, uh, so it, it was, it was a note that to the point where I wasn't having the joint stability that I needed to perform, but I was also starting to have injuries with my tendons and with cartilage and just all sorts of, 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 of in that realm. Uh, so I started working with her um, and that sort of helped me float for a little while. I was, I was kicking and um, I continued to go to summer programs and I was going to go professional, but I had more and more keep sort of snowballing, more injuries and more sublocations. I, uh, and when I was 18, I started getting chronic headaches. I've had, basically I've had a migraine for two and a half years. So it hasn't gone away. Uh, was, you can imagine that's pretty difficult when you're trying to do port bra forward. <laughs> um, so I had to retire because of that and because of some other injuries. But it's been, uh, it's definitely been a very helpful part of that is, is trying to figure out that, that even in dancing, out of dancing of where I should be in, in the socket. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my story of my journey with EDS. Thank you so much for sharing. I, that, it, that takes a lot of bravery and strength. Um, Jennifer, what are some approaches that you recommend for our younger dancers? to strengthen or to take care of their bodies at, from those more tender years? Yeah, so uh, there's a few, I mean, every dancer is different, but there's a few guide points that I, that I work with, um, especially in the younger pre-professionals. First of all, um, slow and low. <laughs> That's how you wanna cook a pre-professional dancer is slow and low. <laughs> low heat, <laughs> low legs, long time to simmer. So, um, uh, I remember Lisa Howell, a, a physiotherapist out of Australia, who's fantastic in the ballet world, talking about how if she ever has the chance to hold a hypermobile dancer off of point for an extra year, she will do it. Um, she prefers to put people with hypermobility on point a year later, give them a chance to get stronger. Um, and, and I do the same thing. I don't have a lot of control over when my dancers go on point, but I can make recommendations and we can talk about strengthening and I can work with the studios. And I've never seen anybody regret going on point later. I have seen, seen them regret going on point too soon. Um, so slow and low through exercising, you know, I can, I have dancers who can do three Paquita variations in a row and can't stand on their leg for five seconds with their eyes closed. They, so hypermobile dancers learn how to cheat, like seriously cheat. We will do whatever it takes 
to get the job done and to please the teacher, or choreographer, whoever it is. Um, but if I ask them to strip down the big motions um, and get really small and, and detailed in a way that you may not feel those end ranges at either end, it's really hard for them. So I try to pull them back to the really small mo movements that they have trouble feeling. Um, and then also low drop those legs. I don't care if you can lift your legs super duper high. Aiden could lift her legs super duper high and she could also subluxate her pubic synthesis multiple yeah. times a day. So um, <laughs> dropping that leg and getting the strength from your trunk to hold that before that leg is up too high. I know Dana's or Dinah's back there going, preach it. <laughs> um, so slow and low with that. Then also proprioception is a big one, trying to develop the hypermobile dancer's sense of where they are in space, especially as they're younger. The younger we can catch them and try to train their body awareness. Um, so proprioception is basically your body's awareness of where you are in space. And in hypermobile people, we depend on our joints to tell us. Um, in a way that's not necessarily healthy. Again, hanging in the back of your knees. When someone says straighten your arms and you straighten your arm and you think, oh, it's straight, but it's not. Like that's straight, but that's locked, right? So learning where to stop, even though it doesn't feel like you've stopped anywhere. <laughs> um, and so learning what that feels like and how to control yourself not going fully to your end range. Um, and then also educating my dancers the whole way through, um, educating them to travel lightly. Um, it's like, you know, you're playing Oregon Trail and halfway through the game, you're throwing stuff out of the cart because you're like, I don't have room for a piano. I don't have room for flour. I just need water and oxen to get me across the desert. And, and as you're dancing, you start going, I don't have room for jazz class. I don't have room for three Pilates classes a week. I don't have room for this. And you have to really pare down and think, what do I need to do to be smart about my career? about my dancing. And then they can go to their teachers or their directors and say, and studies have shown that hypermobile dancers on the spectrum disorder, on the disorder spectrum, um, they need more recovery time. They need more active rest. And so you can go and say, I can go all in on this, but I'm gonna need a half day tomorrow if we go all in on this running it, or if I can mark just the petit allegro or the grand allegro for this section. Or you can say, there was one year Aiden was doing Dewdrop and Snow Queen for Nutcracker all together. And we had to really look at her schedule and say, what can we cut? What classes can we cut back on? What, how can we make it as light as possible and as efficient as possible? So educating them in that way and also educating them to know that early intervention is super important. Um, if you start feeling a twinge in your Achilles or in your shoulder or wherever it is, the sooner you get on top of it, the, the less time it will take to heal. So if you feel that first twinge in your Achilles, your FHL or whatever it is, um, taking two days off then might keep you from taking six weeks off later because hypermobile people take a longer time to heal and come back from those injuries. And then along the same lines with that, the last thing I would say is find a good pit crew. Find a good support team. Um, find a PT who is going to understand you and who's going to know you. And I would rather you get in to see them sooner rather than later. So as soon as that ankle twinges, go see them. Let them get to know you so that six months from now when there is a bigger issue that comes along and you go see them, it's not a get to know you session. They can go, you know, if you've been seeing Dinah, she can go, this is not what you look like six months ago. And here is where I see the difference. So let them get to know you. And then you've got people that you can call on very quickly, a strength and conditioning coach, someone like me, uh, a ballet coach who's really able to help you in, with your technique one-on-one, -on -one, make sure you're not taking any shortcuts. Having that pit crew is going to be super essential. So those are kind of the, the main highlights that I hit when I'm trying to educate my dancers when they first start working with me. Thank you. Yeah. And Dinah, is there anything that you'd like to add on around the um, things that teachers should know when working with young dancers. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. I'm going to be your visual girl. So you said at the beginning of this that you were not hypermobile because you weren't flexible. So I think um, if you think of what Aiden and Jennifer were just talking about, about balance and proprioception and hanging on your joints. So it might be that the muscles aren't flexible and the muscles aren't long, but those joints might be very mobile. So I was thinking, I have a TheraBand because we all have these. So, you know, your, if your ligament is in the back of your joint here, right, and it's supporting you, 
And then you spend all your time with that ligament very, very stretched out. Then the messages that the ligament sends to your brain are kind of sluggish. So your ability for that joint to know, am I straight? Am I hyper straight? Am I balanced? Am I moving right? They're not so good anymore. So the more time teachers get their dancers to pull up in their joints and support themselves and not hang on those ligaments and stretch those ligaments out, they're going to be able to better protect themselves. Thank you. Um, and then going back to Dr. Bluestein. So we spoke before and you said that it's often said from doctors to not dance if you have HEDS. What are your thoughts on that? I have never, ever told a dancer not to dance, ever. Mm. Um, I have talked to dancers about, you know, what are your goals? What, what, what are you wanting to do with your dance? What, where are you at in terms of, um, you know, are you having pain after class? Are you having pain in class? Are you having other problems? Are you having recurrent injuries or whatever? And, um, you know, are, do, are there things that, that maybe might be wise to modify? So I help them kind of think through some of those things, but I never would tell them to not dance. I was told that when I was, you know, about Aiden's age um, and I started having problems as a teenager and that's exactly what I was told. Well, then just don't dance. And that was devastating to me, devastating. Um, so I, I believe that that's um, super important. And I do want to mention too that, um, that those teenage years, that's not a coincidence. Um, a lot of the reasons why in the teenage years people start to run into more problems is because of the menstrual cycles that um, even, if, even if a dancer doesn't necessarily have a menstrual cycle, but they're starting to have the hormones that are being you know, produced around that age time that we're starting to get estrogen and progesterone and things like that. And that can affect joint laxity and the cycling of the hormones, um, even if we're what's called amenorrheic and we don't have an actual period, but that can affect the joints and can cause more symptoms. So I, I, I always ask my patients if they say, gosh, I really can pinpoint it to this time frame. Like, well, when did you start your period? Because it's not uncommon for there to be a relationship. And if, if when we look at people that are using hormones for sex change, um, if it's a male changing to female, they tend to get more pain and do less well. In my experience and my colleagues, if they are female and they're taking testosterone and stuff to transition to becoming male, they tend to do better. Testosterone is protective for pain. So, um, which is another reason why exactly as um, Jennifer said, intervening sooner is much better. I totally agree hundred percent about your pit crew, you know, getting your own Dinah, um, you know, getting your own Jen, you know, hugely important so that you can stay dancing, so that you can stay doing what you love. And so that you have people that can help you determine, is this good pain? Is this bad pain? How can I develop that strength? Because it's really challenging. And once you start to uh, run into more problems with that, then you have less testosterone, which makes it harder to build muscle and it becomes kind of a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and then also speaking about hormones and what's happening internally in the body uh, chemically, do you have any recommendations around nutrition or supplements or anything like that? Um, and please feel free, anyone else, if you want to chime in on it. I'm sorry. Yes, I spent I spend hours and hours and hours discussing this with people. And I strongly recommend that if people are able to work with a uh, registered dietitian because they can look with you at what specifically that you're doing. And I can make some general suggestions. And my general approach um, is an anti-inflammatory one. And I don't know if um, Jen has, uh, Jen, Doctors for Dancers, Jen has access to the link from the, I wrote a paper for Dance USA on um, the uh, inflammation and minimizing your risk of getting like really sick from COVID. And those same recommendations are very, very true for um, managing joint hypermobility. In general, we want to um, eat in a way such that we reduce um, chronic inflammation in our body. And that benefits us from the standpoint of these kinds of conditions and a lot of other things. But again, it's very nuanced. And so there's no one size fits all. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of things to consider. Have you had problems with an eating disorder in the past? Um, you know, what kind of, what are, what are your resources? You know, are you able to afford fresh fruits and vegetables or do you have to eat, you know, other things so that, you know, that can be a good resource for people though. Awesome, thank you. And I had a quick actually question for anyone who wants to jump in from the panel, including Aiden, because I wanna see where this can all be put in practice. For the dancers who do not have the pit crew especially, right? Like I know I'm in this situation a lot where I'm given a professional dancer, young dancer, they're hyper, or to me, to my untrained eyes, they look very hyper mobile, um, very high energy. The one in the front who's like doing everything. <laughs> and I'm on a job where the job wants to see tricks. The job wants to see every, you know, everything possible. Just take out all the stops. What is your hope for me and people that are in the position where we're not training the dancers truly, like the, the studios that have more time with them, but we're on the other end of it. And I know dancers on that other end, on the job that keep on working, they're overworking, they can, right? What's mm -hmm. your hope for me? Like what's that responsibility that we have when we're getting those end results and we're working with them on the job? Okay. All right. So, <laughs> Go girl. Um, you know how the dentist tells you to brush your teeth and floss? And everybody generally does it uh, because you don't want bad breath and you don't want to lose your teeth. And if you don't, you know that when you go back to the dentist, it's going to cost you a crap ton more money and it's going to be painful. So when you recognize it, it and you see that person, you know, you know, if this person just spent a little tiny bit of time every day doing their body toothbrushing exercises, mm -hmm. that would help protect them. And that isn't going to cost them any money, but when they get injured, it's going to cost them a whole bunch. So I think the responsibility is simply to recognize, not ignore, and have the conversation. You know, do you have resources? Is this something you're aware of? Could I help you find resources? You know, do you have your home toothbrushing exercises that you can do? And it can be really simple and really cost effective. I think ignoring it and being like, yeah, raise that leg higher, um, then that person is, is not going to get the tools that they need to continue to move forward in a happy way. Mm. I, I would also say, um, first of all, yes, 100%, totally agree with that. Um, and I think this is a great time to be having this conversation because resources have never been more available than they are right now. Dinah is part of Pivot Dancer, an online platform where you can get lots of great classes and um, great information to help you get stronger. Um, Doctors for Dancers is an amazing resource where you used to look it up and be like, oh, well, there's a person who sounds great, but she's in California. Well, that, maybe that person does Zoom. We all do now, right? <laughs> so this is a great time to start looking in online resource. There are so many online platforms that are going to be pretty cost effective, I think, for what you're going to get back from it. Um, the thing I would add on top of that is that this is also a great time. And Dinah, we were talking about this just a couple weeks ago on the phone for us to say, what is, what is it that maybe we don't want to bring back when the studios open back up and start coming back in? And we have a chance. Um, and, you know, choreographers like you have a chance to say, hey, let's do less birds of paradise and more of this and let's just try this and see if this looks beautiful. And we have that chance to start reshaping choreography and reshape audiences expectations. So let's do it and see what we can do. You know, completely acknowledging that you as a choreographer are hired to come in and do a job and here's what they want. And sometimes they're gonna say, we need to see X, Y, Z. And you're like, okay, I'll put that in there. Um, but maybe this is a chance for us to kind of reshape expectations and, and what what comes out of it at the same time. Aiden, what do you think? Yeah, I, I sort of in, in line with what you're both saying about the, the getting your toothbrushing routine. For me, I call it my baseline. Uh, and I sort of created it. It's like a hodgepodge of things that's one, uh, that I came up with just help because I know what my body flares up and I know how to uh, how to, to get in there before it starts to get too bad and before it gets to, like she's saying, a bigger problem than it should be. Uh, so I have my baseline, as I call it, that I do, and it's it's not crazy stuff. It doesn't require a lot of equipment. Just to it's it's like a heating pad on my back every day and some stretching 
strengthening exercises, that kind of thing. Good stretching, not bad stretching. And uh, and that's that's what I use. I know for, for this more for dancers, uh, but just to start building that because it is so helpful, especially when you're if you're getting slowly getting back in the studio or if you're at home a lot of the time you have the opportunity and now you have access as she's saying to, to people to help you build this to, to go in and start off on a great foot where you have this uh this, this baseline that you can help and build upon but start with a better foundation so that would be my hope is that people can build that better foundation uh because i know it's been so helpful for me I, i've had many injuries from from dance and to, to help those uh, combat those and help me be better able to dance, but also just exist. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that'd be that'd be my my hope. Awesome. And then what I've noticed a lot of um, the dancers that they seem to be hypermobile. They also do a lot of tumbling and tricks, and that has probably impact on the joints. Mm -hmm. Are they more susceptible to injuries from tumbling, or is it the same as if they weren't hypermobile? I'm waiting uh, to see Dr. Dinah take that. <laughs> okay, well, you want me to take that one? Um, no. So a, a compression force is going to load the joint this way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's compression. So you're adding increased compression. I think it's not the compression forces. It's the extreme velocities. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you take those overstretched ligaments and you whip them, um, if you don't have the ability to control, like Aiden was saying, she could whip her leg up there, but she couldn't hold it. So if you're doing lots of tricks and you have the velocity, then and you can't control it by eccentrically reining in those bones as they're flinging them through space, then that is potentially going to lead you down an injury path. Thank you. And Jennifer, we keep on dancing around this, all puns intended. What are some, like, so how do you recommend we strengthen um, dancers that are hypermobile inside of the room, as, inside of the dance class and outside of the dance class? Mm -hmm. um, slow and low. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I always say that trying to strengthen the hypermobile dancer is like trying to shape water. <laughs> it is it is so hard to put muscle on people who have, especially who, people who are on the hypermobile spectrum disorders because collagen is part of muscle, right? Uh, so I there's this fine line where you can work and work and they're like, oh, I can feel that hamstring, I can feel it, and all of a sudden, oh, I have a high hamstring tear and I'm out for nine months. <laughs> from trying to do too many, you know, deadlift rows or something. So it's that fine line of really trying to be consistent and learning how far you can push them to where they're tired, but not so far that they're exhausted and they start to do things wrong and training them what that looks like. And in the dance class as a teacher, it means recognizing the kids who are hypermobile, especially if they're a, a dancer who's on the spectrum um, and who has comorbidities like POTS where they um, can pass out doing a port bras forward or they can get through snow once, but if you ask them to do it a second time, they literally fall on the floor unconscious um, and saying, all right, some dancers can do petit allegro three times and then reverse it three times and then add beats three times and some people can't and it's healthier for them if we only do it twice. And so learning how to recognize that with dancers, can we do fondues twice? Can we do grand allegro or uh, adagio four times? Or are they starting to grip in their hips and do all the cheating just to make us happy? So doing less is more and doing all of that really small, basic, super boring core strengthening, which I don't even like to use the term core, but trunk strengthening um, and learning how to hold from the center of your body rather than further out. So balancing on one foot, not from your ankle strength, but from your hip strength and learning how to use, um, learning how to use those muscles. And I firmly believe that if it's at all possible, you get one-on-one -on -one with someone, even if it's every once in a while, even if it's once every three months to put together a program and have them check back in with you, just so that you can make sure you're doing it right and you get some sort of feedback of that's too much, that's not right, you're using your back, that, that sort of thing. So that, that would be my advice, slow and low, and, and learning how to push but not push too much. Uh, just Thank to kind you. of build on that, if I can, uh, I remember uh, talking about finding cheating. 
there, there's going to, I know from the dancer's perspective, there are going to be times where the teachers are going to ask you to run it again, and you're not always in the position to say, no, thank you. Uh, so for me, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, yeah. So for me, it was finding better cheats, not like physical ones, but I remember there was one point in snow uh, that every time we ran it, we had to run off stage, bend down, grab a prop, and run back on. And at that same point in snow, every single time we ran it, I would black out and totally lose vision. I was still conscious, but I couldn't see anything, which wasn't great when you're black backstage in a dark area. So I would ask my friend who was off on the wing with me, can you grab it for me while you're down there? Uh, so just asking for that help or even going to your teacher and saying, hey, is it okay? Sort of what Jennifer was saying earlier, since I mark this part in this run through, we've already run it three times. Uh, just kind of that thing, be, having that open communication and finding better ways to cheat than sort of taking all on physical level uh, and, and doing things that you'll probably end up in pain for later. Uh, that would be my advice to the dancers who don't always have the capability to say, I don't want to run it again. <laughs> and I, I hope that, um, I'll say it, that teachers that we continue to learn more and more and more so that we can understand the difference between like, pushing through and honoring health and safety and when not to and why. I think mm -hmm. that they're, that's why this is so important. Um, and Dinah, what is it, are there any other ways that you would add on any recommendations on how to train dancers strength when they have hypermobility inside and or outside of the classroom? Totally. Um, well, I think the teachers are amazing uh, at looking. And so using those eyes to give cues and reminders to come up out of your joints in the studio. And then when dancers are at home, like, you know, Jennifer said, I mean, she's all over it, right? The slow and the low is the way to go. And ooh, that rhymes. <gasps> so, um, you know, Aiden talked about useful cheats. There's also the cheats where you creatively turn your home exercise program into something that we didn't give you to do. And so the coming back three months later and checking in, those are super important. But in the in-between time, I like to use like lie detectors, I call them. So if you were doing something like a bear crawl exercise, if you don't know what that is, it's like get down on your hands and knees and stealthfully crawl across the room without anything moving in your trunk. Well, if you were to put like a Kleenex box on your back, and then stealthfully do your crawling, that's gonna give you just that little bit of feedback so you know if you're cheating and moving side to side. So I encourage dancers when they're training at home alone, if they're not working with a regular physio, um, to use like little lie detectors. So balls or cups of water, Tupperware containers, anything like that to help keep those consistent guides. That's great because I know I don't have great proprioception, so I have I don't always know that I'm cheating. So to have that reminder and the very visual or physical reminder that, hey, this isn't right, that's very very helpful because a lot of the times you you don't even you're not trying to change it, you just don't even realize you're doing it in the first place. Exactly, and you said something really good there, visual. So dancers are in front of the mirror all the time, right? And I don't know if as a teacher, like if you've ever flipped your class around away from the mirror and then nobody knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I will use mirrors as training, but I take the mirror away. And um, I would rather use a physical proprioceptor reminder, like a mini band, an elastic, uh, you know, carry this cup of water, now do your balance and don't spill then constantly have it be the mirror. Awesome. Thank you. And Dr. Bluestein, I, is it, do you feel, I'm, I'm calling Dr. Bluestein. We talked about it. I can also call you Linda, but I just, yeah, I love. call me Linda too. That's okay. <laughs> I just really love saying Dr. Bluestein. Um, <laughs> you spoke about the, how collagen is in, it's part of muscle tissue and uh, do I have that right? Is my a, wording wrong on it? It's basically a part of like, almost all of our, we only actually have four different types of tissues in the body. And one of those is connective tissue. So it's connective tissue. Collagen is like everywhere. So do you have, um, I, I think you have some research on this, any recommendations around, do you recommend supplementing collagen? What are your thoughts on it? So there's, there's some interesting research that shows that it's 
very possibly broken down in the stomach and not really absorbed. I mean, we're talking about if you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, that you have a genetic reason why you are not building collagen properly. And mm -hmm. so the problem is, um, you know, at the level of, of genetics. Um, but what we do with our diet does matter tremendously. And so I do believe that, especially if you're a vegetarian or vegan, and, you know, potentially you are, um, you know, getting less collagen in your diet, that potentially supplementing your diet with hydrolyzed collagen, which is when it's already been kind of partially broken down, um, that if you take that as a supplement, that it falls into the category of probably not going to hurt and might help. So to me, it's all about when I'm giving a recommendation to a patient, it's all about risk benefit. So if I'm talking to a room full of dancers, you know, and I'm making, you know, giving them information and making some suggestions, you know, I'm always going to go with the things that are more safe. So taking, a, taking hydrolyzed collagen is quite safe. Um, you know, there is, they usually do come like from chicken or whatever. So if you are a strict vegetarian, then you wouldn't probably do that. But um, I, I do give that recommendation not infrequently. And gelatin is another thing that some people will um, sometimes incorporate into their diet for the, for the same reason. Awesome, thank you. Do you have, a, so if you are vegan, does that mean there's just no collagen supplement? Is there a precursor? That is a very good question. Um, and a vegan, vegan is such an interesting thing. I had a, I had a vegan, um, I was working with a vegan patient once and she ate Captain Crunch cereal for breakfast, Captain Crunch cereal for lunch. And then I forget <laughs> what she had for dinner, but it was like the most unhealthy diet like ever. So um, it's, that's where it's really important to dig into what are they consuming? Because I think we often forget that food is, you know, necessary for our cells to develop properly. You know, we are constantly building cells and breaking down cells. And the other problem that happens as we get older is the ratio is, isn't as favorable for us. So when, you, you know, when we're really young, we're, you know, you know how like a baby, they get a little, if they accidentally scratch their face, like they wake up the next morning and it's gone, like miraculously gone. But, you know, as you get older, you just like, you look at yourself and you're like, wow, I don't even know how I got that, you know, and then it takes forever to heal. So it's like building bricks on a, on a wall. So, you know, injuries, you have to be putting more bricks on than you're taking off in order for the injury to heal. And as we get older, we're just not able to put those bricks on as quickly. So it's really important to make sure that we're giving our body the nutrients that it needs. I mean, our body needs, you know, all kinds of vitamins and minerals and protein and, you know, carbohydrates and fat, you know, fat is, is important. We need healthy fats in our diet. So. Thank you so much. I'm actually, I know we could talk about this for hours and I want to, but we, um, we have to wrap it up very shortly. Also, uh, Jennifer Milner is going to have to run off at in four minutes sharp. So just if, you know, she disappears quickly, that's just why. So we want to open this up to Q&A, getting to a couple of questions. And there is one question. I'm just going to go ahead and read it because I don't want to misword it. So um, someone asks, they, they say first, there's an argument in the movement and structure and fascia research world about training in the hypermobile range of motion versus trying to learn to remain in a more natural and biochemically efficient and normal range of motion. It's not solely specific to dancers, it's general for movement and training hypermobile clients and kids. So like, what are your thoughts on that for hypermobile movers? Do you stay in the natural range of motion? Do you work with that they have a greater range of motion? I, I work throughout range. Mm -hmm. Which one? So I work through that person's range because they need got to it. have strength through their range. Mm -hmm. Got it. And I, I totally agree. I think it depends partly on who you're training, right? If you're training um, a circus artist, they have to have strength through their entire range of motion. Uh, if you're a training a dancer, um, there may be some positions they don't have to go all the way in. But even we talked earlier about hyperextension in the knees. I don't want my dancers to stand in full hyperextension, but I want them to use that hyperextension when it's their gesture leg, right? Because the, it's considered a beautiful aesthetic line in the ballet world. So they have to learn to stand strong on their supporting leg and then allow themselves to go into their full end range motion for their gesture leg. So I want them to be strong in every different position of it and then just training them when it's appropriate to use which part of it. Do I want 
people to hang into unhealthy places, especially in their hip sockets with like oversplits and things like that. No, if I look at circus artists, aerialists who do those huge oversplits, there's a lot of muscle work that's going on there to keep themselves from just hanging in it. Like you see kids sometimes just sitting with their feet up on chairs. So there's a huge difference between hanging in that position and having strength throughout that full range of motion. And it's, it's worth noting too that like Aiden dislocated her shoulder several times doing finger turns in ballet. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, that's just what happens, you know? So you don't even have to be in what people would consider a, a crazy huge range of motion to be unsafe and unstable. Um, she had a teacher lift her leg into arabesque in class in one class and dislocated her pubic symphysis um, when he lifted it too quickly to arabesque. And she was like, hang on she knows how to pop it back in by that point. But so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the end range where there is even the most danger. And I think that the danger is, is trying to say you can never go in this range of motion or you must always work here and then ignoring the full potential and not giving them the tools to work through their full potential. Thank I think you. the key is doing Thank it safely. You. Awesome. I'm going to take one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. Maya asks if I'm hypermobile and exhibiting some of the EDS slash hypermobile disorders, should I get checked by a doctor? And also if you have a moment to hang out after, we will quickly um, have a, a few wrap up polls that are really important. So yes, so any thoughts on that? If you're hypermobile and exhibiting some of the EDS hypermobile disorders, should one get checked by a doctor? And what type of doctor? I'm gonna add that on. <laughs> I, I can take that one. I want to add a real quick thing to what Jen said, which I totally agree with. Um, what, was my, what was my note here? Oh, we only know what our own body feels like, which I think is part of the challenge with mm. this. So I had no idea that I was subluxing and dislocating my own shoulders until I started treating people with EDS. Like, like I, I found out like everyone, like, like a lot of people, I that, oh, I was reading. And I was like, I wonder if this is what, this is why I don't heal well. And this is why I keep getting injured and, and things like that. And went to my doctor and got diagnosed. But um, it's, it's hard because we don't know what is and isn't normal because, you know, I don't know what Aiden's body feels like or what Jen's body feels like, you know. Um, so, so that's one thing to just kind of keep in mind as we're talking about these things. And then I wanted to also add about the, um, the about the loading all the time I'm giving lectures to a group of dancers and they're all leaning back on their incredibly hyperextended elbows. There's no advantage to that. You know, there's, I think for everything, we need to weigh the risk and the benefit. And exactly as Jen said, the gesture leg being slightly hyperextended for the effect of the line is very different than, you know, leaning on a hyperextended elbow. There's, a, there's no advantage to leaning on a hyperextended elbow. But in terms of getting a workup, yes, it's extremely important. So if you have, um, you know, if you are suspecting that there might be some kind of a hypermobility disorder going on, yes, I do strongly recommend that you see a doctor. A couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, if you go to a doctor and they don't know what EDS is, they don't know what a hypermobility disorder is, do not panic or, you know, I mean, I've, I've, see, I've read online, I've seen people, you know, say things about, oh, they were looking it up. You know, um, we can't know everything. We absolutely cannot, even within a fairly narrow range. So if you're going to your primary care doctor, it's not uncommon that they won't know what this is. If you, on my website, there's um, the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile EDS. You can access that um, information. And if you take that sheet to your doctor and say, you know, I'm wondering if maybe this applies to me, could we discuss it at my next visit? Because we need to keep in mind that they only have a limited amount of time. So that's a, an approach that I recommend all the time to people um, as a way of working with their doctor. And if their doctor says, you know, I don't know what that is, but they are willing and want to help you, then that's really what you need. You know, if they, if they know what it is and they're super knowledgeable about it, but they're not actually really wanting to help you or willing to work with you, then that doesn't help you. So you need somebody who is really um, open-minded and non-judgmental and like will, will, you know, work with you as part of your pit crew. Yeah, Thank you to, so to build on mm -hmm. that. I had, I had one doctor who was an EDS specialist who was not a great doctor. And I remember I left the office and I thought I'll never go back because he was so negative about EDS and all that. But my PCP who isn't as, 
aware of EDS and is still sort of learning as we are as we do it is like one of my favorite doctors because he's so open-minded and willing to learn and to, to, to reach out and to, to, to work with me instead of just sort of going with whatever yes so exactly so that finding that pit crew can be a real trial and trial and error process but it's such an important part when you get there that it's, it's a great asset to have thank you so much thank you for everyone for joining please stick around for just two more minutes um this, i mean i'm preaching to the choir but this is so important dances to any dancer dances everything and we, we want to be able to do this for as long as possible. So I, I highly recommend, please, this is going to be on YouTube and we have the other videos up on the Dan Doctors for Dancers YouTube. So please, for everyone who didn't get to be here, if you could just share with them, sharing is caring. And we want to thank you for joining. What do dancers need to know about being bendy? We have three polls. They're quick polls. They're going to be back to back. Two are going to have um, the same questions from the beginning. We want to gauge how, how we did in sharing the knowledge. And one is going to be so we know how we did. So we really want to keep on sharing this information with you. And we're going to explore different topics. If you have any feedback, we'd love to know in the chat box. Or you can send us a message at contact at doctorsfordancers.com. You can visit www doctors for dancers to find a dance specialist near you i'm also on there as a certified personal trainer i love giving cross training to dancers um it's a passion of mine so yeah seriously thank you and we're going to go into poll number two quickly and thank you also everyone for seriously for taking the time all of the panelists that are here that you've invested years and years and years and uh, um, in your field and in your expertise and that you care for the dance world and that you're, you're podcasting about it. And then I know that a lot of this, when I looked at your bios, it came from your own injuries um, in situations that were not easy to say the least to go through. And instead of just, you know, doing nothing about it, you became experts around how to help others. And this includes the lovely and young Aiden. I mean, the way that you're, you're speaking up and you're exploring this and you're being so proactive and so open, this just, I know it's a game changer. Even for me, you know, the next time I have a hypermobile dancer walking in the door, I feel like I, I know a little bit more so I can do a bit better. So thank you. Thank you so um, much for having out. me. I had a great Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yay, party. And then do, uh, Jennifer, Doctors for Dancers, do we have our next Zoom set up? Is it confirmed? Can I share the date or do people need to keep an eye out? Mid-October. So keep your eye out at least one for mid-October. It's going to be all about the hips because our hips don't lie. They tell the truth. <laughs> Likely on the 14th, time TBD. About the popping. The popping of the hips, can anyone relate? Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, do you, do you want me to come back for that one? We can talk, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everyone. We're going to close out in about 30 seconds. Have a wonderful day or evening. Thank you for, for carving out the time for this and to come together.